Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is called Paradise Lost, and it plays for two to five players. In the game Paradise Lost, the Ice Queen Nimu has basically captured you and all of your friends from fables of all types of imaginary worlds, whether you're going to be Beowulf or whether you're going to be Little Red Riding Hood, and placed you in this imaginary world in which they have cho she has chosen one villain to come out and try and to control all of the universe or whatever you want to say. And uh, basically what you need to do is find the sword or the weapon of choice in order to defeat the foe. And if you can do that by figuring out which of the foes it is, you're going to win. The game is similar to games like Clue, but has unique mechanics that feature games like Glenmore Chronicles or uh, Francis Drake. Games that are going to be moving around the board where you can go as far as you want, but you can't ever go backwards. It has the idea of trying to ask your allies what cards they have in their hand to get an idea of who the villain is and what weapon you need to use to defeat them, and also the ability to land on certain spaces to collect certain actions that will give you the ability to get more knowledge as well as more beneficial ways of dealing with the foes. Not always do you need to actually figure out who the foe is, sometimes you can actually complete certain things to do so as well. There's quite a lot in this game. It's basically going to be Clue, but a little bit more complex, a lot more um, fantastical in nature, and also uh, includes all of our beloved fairy tale characters. Let's go down below, I'll show you everything in the game, what you get, and then we'll show you how to play the game Paradise Lost. So here we have Paradise Lost and everything included in the game. And as you can see, it is pretty big. Now, of course, it may or may not be the size. This is a prototype, but a beautiful one nonetheless. Spoiler alert, I love the artwork for this game. Anyway, let's talk about the setup for the game as well as what you get inside the game. Now, this first you're going to notice is you've got little character meeples that are gonna be there. That is the placement to start with. You'll be rolling that die. It has a one through five and a blank. Whoever gets the highest goes in the back and then it goes clockwise all the way down the line. Line, and you're starting in those little blue areas there. The Witch's Wrath and Rage Tracker, you're going to have Witch's Wrath cards and they're going to place, shuffle them and place them there along with placing the Rage at one. You're also going to roll the die before uh, putting it over there and uh, based on where you roll, this one here is going to go to that specific location. They all have different symbols on the die and as well as numbers and based on the symbols we're going to put the little character there or whatever it gives you. Then you're gonna roll this die here and place it over here. This is gonna be the cost in order to ask questions for the, from the Oracle. And there's four times you're going to be doing that throughout the game. It doesn't really matter who rolls the die, but you go ahead and place it there. Uh, you're also going to be getting this little handy dandy uh, set of papers, which much like Clue is going to have you trying to deduce who the villain is and what weapon you need in order to defeat them. It will also give you a legend for each of the spaces represented on the board based on their color, what the cost is for that space and what you get on the space when you land there. Uh, additionally, you're going to get one of these location tiles. There are five of them in total and they're all different locations. You're going to look at it yourself but not show anyone else. You're also going to get characters. You'll get two of them to start off with. Choose one of them and put the other one back. That character will have a passive ability and it will also have an active once per game ability as well. Over there I chose Red Riding Hood. You'll also get a pencil and one of each resource and or currency. There are coins here. There there are these mana crystals here, and then there are these cubes here you'll be utilizing in the game. You'll get one of each of those. Uh, there's also going to be a deck of cards. Uh, there's going to be weapons, there's going to be villains, and then there's going to be specials. There'll be two specials, and there'll be maybe additional promo cards you might be getting in the campaign. Uh, what you're going to do first is take out these specials. You're going to shuffle each of the decks separately, the villains and the weapons, and then you're going to place one from each deck face down, make sure nobody sees it, into this little uh, hidden all-seeing eye of envelope over here. So you're going to take this guy here, choosing a random weapon and a random villain, and just put it in here. When you do that, you're then going to take all of the cards that are left over, including the specials. Let's see if I can get these guys in here. 
Uh, there we go. And you're going to shuffle them together and then deal them out onto the oracle spaces on the board. So you'll shuffle these pretty good, add the special cloak of invisibility and of course the Excalibur. And then put one on each of these oracle locations. We'll probably put it off the board, but so you guys can see it, I'll just put it on the board here. Uh, and then of course, based on the number of players, you're gonna deal out cards to them basically removing the rest of the cards, emptying them. So if it's a three player game, you're gonna deal out the rest of these cards to each of the players, just like this. You can also, of course, add any additional uh, weapons and or villains or exchange them if you would like uh, to add flavor. If you do add additional cards, you would put one on the first space and one on the last space. After everybody's gotten everything all set up, you're going to begin your game uh, trying to deal with the witch, find out which champion she has selected, or villain I should say, and then acquire the or figure out the weapon you need in order to defeat that champion. And if you can do that at the end of the game and you have the first guess, you'll win. If you guess wrong, at the end of the game you're done, just like in Clue, that's making your accusation, and the next player will get a chance to guess, utilizing all the information you gave along with what they have on their score sheet. If they guess, they win. If not, they lose in the next person. You get the idea of the game, I think. Anyway, that's pretty much what you get, including, of course, the rule book, the box, and this magnificent board here. Let's go uh, on the other side, and I'll explain how to play. Okay, so we're back, and as you can see, I officially switched sides, thusly committing the to the scene transition, so now we can begin talking about how to play the game. As you can see, I have now my hand of cards, and I'll be using Little Red Riding Hood as an example. I have horns in my hand, flaming arrows, Sir Mordred, and legendary armor. These are my cards for, uh, for me and me alone, until somebody gets the chance to peek at them. Uh, I'm going to mark them down on my little, uh, my little piece of paper here. All the ones I mark down are ones that I have seen, and if I have seen them or they are mine, that means they are not the villain that I need to defeat, nor are they the weapon that I need to obtain, or the knowledge I need to know, what weapon I need to get, uh, in order to guess at the end of the game, much like Clue. I've got my currency, I've got my location, which means this is the location that this little middle board area needs to be in order for me to gain a bonus at the end of the game, and I have my placement. I'll just simply go ahead and be this character here, which is yellow, and uh, I have my die rolled here. It's going to cost me one coin during this oracle in order to ask people questions. So when you begin, it's always the person that is in the last position on the board that is going to move. Just like Francis Drake and Glenmore Chronicles, you are going to be going as many times as you can if you're the last person, and uh, it will go very, very simply. When you place, you're going to be able to place anywhere on this track here, and it moves along until it gets this oracle space. Each of these spaces has a color, and some of them have little outstretching branches, which is available in a four and a five player game. However, in a lower player game, you simply ignore these spaces and they're not to be used. Whenever you land on the space, you'll check your little handy dandy chart here if you need to, and it will tell you what they do. Red spaces will let you get red scrolls, dark blue will let you get dark blue scrolls. The red scrolls will let you not have to know who the villain is at the end of the game to win, and the blue scrolls will let you know what weapon it is uh, at the end of the game without having to actually know it. If you have both the red scrolls and blue scrolls all finished, at the end, uh, it will instantly end the game and you will instantly win. Now that's also very, very difficult, but you can do it. Uh, you're also going to have places like Arena that will let you trade uh, in mana, one mana for two of these. There's another space that lets you trade two coins for uh, one coin for two mana. Uh, there is a marketplace that you can spend three of these for one cube or three of these for one cube, a scroll for two of these or two of these. You basically can trade in that space. There's a Wildlands where you can go ahead and take any space that you want provided nobody is on it, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, two, two, two cards, two, there's two spaces as well, the black one and the white one for these cards here. This is more of like the truth deck in which you're going to try and ask questions to players or get bonus information. And the black swan deck could be really, really good or really, really bad, potentially, depending on what you draw. After you've placed and done whatever your action is, so let's say I simply go over to this purple space here, I look on the board here, it says a shrine, spend one coin and get two of these crystals here. I am now done because I'm no longer in the last position on the board, and it will now be Blue's turn. Blue can go here, 
or he can go here or anywhere on this map. Now remember, the farther you go, the less turns you're gonna get for each of these, I'll call them rounds, but it's areas on the board. So make sure you, you choose the best spaces you possibly can and get the most out of each area before advancing to the Oracle. This person will go ahead and go to this space, thusly being able to draw one of these cards, and it says ask a question. As if you were at an Oracle, no player has immunity from this question. So I can say, do you, uh, is, is the villain the huntsman or is the weapon flaming arrows? In which case I could choose a person to ask that question to and then they would be able to say, oh, here, look at this card, meaning they have one of those, or no, I don't, I don't know, I don't have those cards. And then it would go until somebody showed me something. If nobody did, it would just simply be done. That would be the end of my question. Um, that's how those cards mainly work. There's, there's a lot of other things that they do as well. Then this player is going to get a chance to go, and they'll do this one here, which I believe is a black space, drawing a black swan. Draw a scroll card from a scroll deck or gain three mana. These are the scroll decks here. Now what's also interesting to note is scrolls are going to be placed from one, uh, a stack of one, on top of a stack of two, on top of a stack of three, then four, and then five. And you're going to need to get one of each of the numbers in order to complete the scroll deck. So there's a one there, which means you get this one red space, maybe you get this wild space that will give you another one. Uh, and so on and so forth, all the way around the board. And why you do that is because, like I said, once you get a complete set, you'll be able to ignore the villain. In addition, there's some scroll cards, they're gonna have these little uh, snowflake symbols on them. When that happens, you're gonna move this guy up on the tracker. Whenever you get the, that specific scroll, you move the guy up on the tracker. And if ever, ever the guy moves on the tracker onto this little space here, which represents the uh, a big snowflake, you'll draw one of these Witch's Wrath cards. Double the cost of all questions at Oracles. This is the cost of questions at Oracles. And that will last uh, until the end of the, until the next one pops out, basically. And then you're just going to keep going. And players are going to keep moving around the board, uh, doing all the spaces they can. Eventually, there's going to be no more spaces to go to, or they're simply going to want to go to the Oracle, in which case you're going to put yourself in the first position if you got there first, in the second position if you got there second, third, fourth, and fifth. Players who got there first will get one coin and one gem, and everybody except for the last player will get to choose one of either or. And the last player is going to get to look at one of these location tiles and then place it anywhere on this track that they want. That's what they get to do. After they do that, they're going to be able to spend currency based on the die roll and ask players questions to get obtain more information. And to ask a question, like I said before, is pretty simple. You say, uh, you can ask basically up to two cards. And you can say, do you have the Huntsman or do you have Beowulf? And in which case they can show you a card. And if they do, that is done. You're done with your question. If they don't, you can move on to the next person in clockwise order. And you can also choose the person you want to start with asking questions first. There's also an invisible cloak card somewhere in here. And if you ask a person a question, they can simply give you that cloak and refuse to answer you. So that is a potential thing, as well as the Excalibur. But if you use Excalibur, it gets discarded and one of these little tile, all these little cards get flipped over and bad stuff happens as well. Nevertheless, that's how questions go. Whenever you see a card, you mark it down on this little track here and that will let you know, get you a little closer to the truth as regarding to what villain it is as well as what weapon is needed. Then you're going to advance this little marker here for every one of the oracles except for the fourth one. And then you can spend these little guys here to manipulate this location area. Every time you spend one or two cubes, you'll be able to move one of these guys. If you spend one cube, you can look at one of the tiles and choose to flip it over and then choose to also move it. If you spend two, two of these little guys here, these little cubes, you can choose to flip a tile over and move it. And then if you spend three tiles, or three cubes, you can place three onto a tile and lock it in place forever. Thusly, making the game a little more helpful for you. But of course, these are very, very difficult to obtain, so you want to use them sparingly if you can. Then, after that, the player who is in last position is going to... Oh, sorry. The, and that's going to happen 
four players uh, as they leave this Oracle area. So this player will get a chance to do that when they leave. This player will get a chance to do that as well, and so on and so forth. Thusly giving the first player the, the last choice as to their movement, but the last choice as well to manipulate this board here, which is very beneficial. And that's basically how the game goes. One of these, die, the die will get re-rolled and then placed over here. And players are going to move across here. Another thing to note too is whenever you get to these locations here, you're also going to flip this uh, card over, which gives you some more information regarding what villain it's not or what weapon it's not. And if any of these locations, he, uh, oracles here, have the cloak or the... Excalibur, the person who gets to these locations first, the oracles first, are going to take that card into their hand and then they'll be able to utilize it. Uh, otherwise, that's pretty much the game. They're going to go from this oracle to this one to this one all the way to the end. At the end of the game, there's going to be one last opportunity to go ahead and choose a space. And in a five, four or five player game, you can choose the black space. There's two options for the black space. At what point players in order will be able to guess who the villain is and who what, what weapon is needed in order to defeat them. If they can do that, they win. Now, in order to do that, there's the first thing, which is this gate over here, which says whoever has the most coins, at the end of the game, you roll the die. This one says whoever has the most coin gets the first guess, whoever has the most mana, whoever has the most of both, whoever has the most cubes, and whoever has the most scrolls. Depending on what the die rolls at the beginning of the game is who is going to get the first choice. However... If this location here is actually yours, so for instance, if let's say the board looks something like this, and you happen to have Pagan Wasteland, so all of these spaces were, uh, were filled in, and you had Pagan Wasteland, then you are the one that is going to be able to choose one of three options. The first one is look at a card that's faced down on the board. The second one is you're going to be able to choose to go first regardless of that. And then the third one is you can ask a question to a player, thusly using the Oracle ability. Sometimes this will be useful as well because the game can end early if this guy gets all the way to the end of this witch's track, but it won't happen until at least this portion of the game where you get into this area here. A uh, last thing to note as a, a tiny caveat, uh, these spaces here, when they're face down, they're called X's, which means that the the, uh, these spaces cannot be it and when they're face up there's different requirements or different statements on all of them and it always must remain true in this middle here so this one here says that either this space or this space must be the location so this would be an illegal placement if this was the last one drawn and this would actually work meaning that this is the location uh, there could also be this one here which would mean that this is the location it's, has, it's got a check mark and then there um, is this one over here this one says that it must be this one or this one, meaning that this is also a true statement. So there always must be a true statement on the board here uh, throughout the entire game. And the way you change it, of course, is by spending these little cubes here, thusly changing the board of the, changing uh, the, the, the area here. So you can go ahead and turn this face down or, or you can simply move it. That would still be a correct statement. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you're gonna then, based on who goes first, second, third, and fourth, ask the question. If you fail the guess, you're done, you lose the game. The next player will get a chance and so on and so forth. The person who's able to guess the combination correctly is the winner of the game. Paradise Lost. Woof. All right. Let me tell you what I think about it. My voice is almost dead. Okay, so I had a little break for my voice, but now we're back to show you the review for the game Paradise Lost. Uh, this game is a mixture, a conglomeration of Clue meets uh, Francis Drake's beginning phase meets some kind of like amalgamation of like resource management. It's got a lot of stuff going on for it. It's a very complex version of Clue, but once you get going, it's actually not too bad. It's you're just moving around the board to each of the oracles, asking questions, trying to at the end of the game guess which weapon and which low and which uh, villain it is and that's it if you can do that you win the game but first of all the artwork is amazing in this game this is really 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 good i love the board in this game it feels like a full world is attached to this board as you're moving around that there's different locations and it feels like you're visiting them as you're trying to solve the mystery and there is a mystery it's somewhat cooperative in the way that you want to avoid the witch's wrath as much as possible but it's very competitive as well because you want to avoid giving out information as best as you can. The more players in this game is obviously going to be better. I would highly suggest this game with four and five players. 
But in a five player game, it's very likely that the location is going to be more important than the objective unless the game ends early, which is not super likely, at least as far as we've played. We played a couple times already, and now we're like, this is not even close to the track. However, it, 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 it could end earlier, I, I imagine. Um, also, another little quick note is each of the little characters here have their passive ability and whatnot. The Billy Goat Gruff says they can, it's ignore the Water Witch Rage card effects, so all those never affect the Billy Goat. And once per gain, game, he gains one of the cubes for free, which is really, really good, actually. I want... I should use this character. Uh, but uh, they all have their own unique benefits and their own unique passive abilities. It makes the game a little different, a little more unique. It's like as if Mr. Green was able to move to the billiard room once per game. Super cool, super fun. Uh, also, I like the feeling of always feeling like you can go forward if you're the last position and everybody's moved far ahead of you. You get a couple turns to do what you want. Sometimes that marketplace won't be utilized, which is nice. So you get that free market space and an extra turn ability. Uh, I like that. That's really simple as to how it's, how it's played. It's always the last person moving. Moving. And then the Oracle phase basically separates the game into rounds in which players will be able to manipulate the location and ask people questions like you wouldn't clue. Additionally, you're going to get resources for that you get there sooner, place the location if you get there last, and then manipulate it based on when you got into that little Oracle space. And uh, it's, it's just got a bunch of that cool little stuff going on. But it's all written on the board, which is also nice as well. All of the locations are written on the board of where everything goes. Every time you go to a certain space, it's represented on this little piece of paper here, which you're always going to have with you. And this is pretty much all you need to understand how the game goes once you understand how movement works. It's fun. I really enjoy this. I also like the fact that there's multiple victory conditions. You can win the game by getting all of the red and all of the blue scrolls. If you can do that, the game's over. You've won because you managed to do something that's very, very difficult. But if you only get one or the other, you still only need half of the information the game provides. So maybe you want to actually only go for villains and blue scrolls. So all you do is ask about villains the entire time you're at the oracles, and all you're trying to do is gather blue scrolls while you're on the location spaces. That plays a strategy as well. The witch kind of manipulates the board as well and affects players in a negative way. Everyone is affected negatively, which is another nice thing about the game because it always feels fresh and different when you're playing the game because you never know what that witch is going to do. And of course, the game has the opportunity to end early, which is also interesting as well because as you're playing the game, you notice that witch track is moving farther and farther and you're like oh no am i going to be able to guess this and this maybe i won't get the scrolls maybe i have to go back to at least trying to knock off these little uh spaces as much as i can to give myself the best opportunity it's very likely at the end of the game that you're not going to have 100 percent information so you might have to actually make a guess but you'll be able to deduce certain things based on what everybody else asks as well oh she asked for that and he asked for that in this case i know that this character doesn't exist because i don't have it either so you can gain information from other players and certain cards in the game as well black swans being a double-edged sword is really cool draw a scroll card and gain three mana that's really nice choose uh, two coins or two mana and take it to, from other players but you can also lose two coins you can also lose two mana uh, you can increase the witch rage marker by one you can lose a seeker cube so you have to be careful as to gathering these they're always going to be better than the uh, white cards as to getting stuff but the white cards have some unique aspects as well to them they're going to have stuff like asking questions to players removing a hideout token that's not locked in manipulating the location board in some way exchanging one of your oracle cards with another player which is basically giving information to the player as well as getting it yourself and additionally you're going to be utilizing um the the spaces on the board here as you go to each oracle popping up new information you can actually look at these face down cards if you get certain cards in the game or have certain abilities which will give you a heads up early in the game as to what you need to know what knowledge needs to be presented especially if the game ends early and uh, the final thing is the Excalibur. That card is a very powerful trump card, but it only works once and, of course, makes the witch do something nasty. And the Cloak of Invisibility, whenever you don't ask a question, you pass it to the player who asked you, and that player now has it to use for next time if somebody asks them a question. So it's going to be passed around constantly in the game. All that is really, really, really cool. Overall, this is a really solid game. If you like Clue in any way, that one is <laughs> out. I would never play Clue again now that I have this game. I enjoy this far more. I like the extra mechanics in this game. I like how it's based on a timer. And I like the fact that you don't have to just win by doing the guessing. So remembering how to mark everything down and what questions are best to ask. You can do something completely different and still win this game. Overall, Paradise Lost, 
excellent game. My seal of approval. I really, really enjoyed this one. My last little comment is on, I don't like the fact that at the very end of the game, if I ask the question uh, from from uh, from having the uh, ability, having the location, because I'm the location, if you have that, you can ask a question. Uh, I don't like the fact that the player can give you an invisibility cloak. I wish that was not a thing. That, that perturbed me beyond all belief because I worked so hard for it and wasn't able to get the information. But I can see how it's relevant. So still, seal of approval. Love this game. It's fun. All right, guys. Thanks for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. If you like this video, go and check out the rest of our videos. Here on YouTube, like, subscribe, and comment. Go ahead and subscribe, and also hit that notification bell button. It does help me, as well as help you, know when our latest videos are coming out. Also, don't forget to check out Paradise Lost down below in the description. This is going to be a really cool game for you clue lovers out there, along with trying to get people who are not as much interested in the clue aspect of the game to still play because there's other opportunities to do other other things in this game to win. Also, don't forget to check out our website, unfilteredgamer.com. We have tons of blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter lists, and more, as well as checking out the fact that we have the game Dogs being given away currently on our website. And our last thing is every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. PST at the Unfiltered Gamer Facebook, we are giving away games on our live stream and playing games just like this one here. Uh, it's a lot of fun and we try and get the community involved in a lot of ways, of course, as well as giving away games and stuff. And don't forget to check out our friends, everythingboardgames.com, The Giveaway Geek, and Ferdinand the Cardboard Stacker. Three great places to go ahead and check out new content. They also give giveaways and have a lot more blogs than even my own site. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. And as always, my voice is out and paradise has been lost. <laughs>